Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 212 of Ukraine War Diaries with Mark Fagan, Russian opposition journalist, and Alexei Rostovich, Lieutenant Colonel Advisor to the Office of the President of Ukraine. They discuss the situation on the front as those occupied territories go into the fake referendum. Part of it is held actually, you won't believe it, on the territory of Russia. Well, without further ado, enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Friday, September 23rd, and it is 2 minutes past 10 in Kyiv. Day 210 with our friend Alexei Rostovich. Glad to see you, Alexei. Good evening, everybody. All right, we have 140,000 watching us live, over 26,000 click the like button. Appreciate uh, those who are spending their priceless Friday night with us, listening to some things we laugh about, others that we are very serious about. Subscribe to both of our channels, uh, Fagin Life, Alexei Rostovich, and uh, if you are watching that in English, subscribe to the Privateer Station and click the like button. After the last two days of uh, really popular and fantastic streams, um, let's go to discuss more news. There's more stuff coming from Russia. Uh, most people have seen those videos, and the further it continues, the more it reminds of uh, DMB demobilization uh, movie. Uh, it was a military sort of comedy, but with a, this one is going to have a much more dramatic finale. So let's address what's up on the front, what's going on with the so-called referendums and mobilization. Let's take a look at the map. Okay, if we look where Izum and Kupinsk are, okay, we see that. Uh, it's to the east from Izum and straight south from Kupinsk. We see a little bit of water. See at the red side there is a, a bit of water and if you zoom closer, Okay. So below that reservoir, um, below that water body, um, Skivka was taken, and it seems like you guys are taking more on the left bank of the river. Yeah, this map shows Karovi Yar, Psovka, uh, it appears that your presence on the left bank expands. Well, uh, General Command did not acknowledge Karovi Yar and some other settlements, but Skivka, yes, it's ours. And one can see that uh, Liman potentially is facing a risk of being surrounded. Now let's go south. Belogorovka was not acknowledged officially for a while. But looking at the map, one can tell that very likely it is taken. Belogorovka is uh, on this map right in the middle now, that blue area. And then if you go south near Bakhmut, that uh, situation reminds older days near Papasna, Lysychansk, Severodonetsk, when uh, Russian side concentrates prevailing artillery and they level our positions, uh, we withdraw, their army pours in, we kick them out, take it back, and then everything repeats again. Um, there is some motion below that, towards Marienka and Avdeevka, but um, it's much less action happening there. Zaporozhye is very quiet, um, besides the fact that Russian troops are moving and rearranging and probably trying to create some scary formations that are designed to not let Ukrainian troops to break through towards Militopol and Takmak. And traditionally, Kherson region. Today, on a dam in Nova Kachovka, we hit uh, the column of uh, equipment 
So they fixed up the dam, the dam bridge a little bit, and as they were crossing it, we hit them very effectively. By the way, today is an interesting date. There is a commander of 144th Division that were in Kharkov region for a while. And we were waiting for that uh, front. We're scared if maybe it'll start moving, maybe they'll, they'll start attacking Kharkov. So the commander of that division, General Major Tsokov, it's his birthday today. But there is a nuance. He was in that building in Svatova two days ago, which we hit with several missiles and destroyed the command of the 20th Army. And uh, it appears that he might have been there at the meeting. So there is a strong chance that this will be his last birthday because his technical condition has a lot of questions with the medics at the hospital where he was taken to. This will be 11th or 12th officially killed general from the Russian side on that war. Uh, unofficially, the tally is two more, but officially acknowledged uh, is about 11 or 12. We also shot down six Iranian UAVs and one Su-25 uh, Russian jet. Odessa was uh, hit, Dnieper was hit with these UAVs. It can mean two things. They either starting to save missiles or they're trying to use new weapon and gauge our reaction to that. So the fact that these UAVs were shot down, does it mean that the Western means are effective? What did you use to shoot them down? Oh, we shot them down with the usual anti-air defense made by Soviet Union, old but uh, still effective. But another fact that Iran decided to help Russian Federation was noticed on the West and is now taken into consideration, uh, so we might expect some reaction from the West towards Iran. We don't know when and how it will come, but I don't think that will go unnoticed. Plus, they're also gauging the effectiveness of Iranian weapons on this war as the potential foe of the West and the country that sponsors terrorism. And uh, real battle experience is a very precious story, so yeah, they observe how we're dealing with them. We have almost 320,000 watching us live. We are just 8 minutes on air. 80,000 plus click the like button. Okay, so about the situation on the front, everything is rather clear. Let's talk about mobilization. Judging by the videos that appear, could you make any conclusions about those uh, people that are being mobilized? Because there is a ton of videos starting to pour into various social media. And we'll have a lot of witness materials of quality and quantity that we can discuss. What do you think about that? I will start with my personal impressions. First of all, that I'm impressed with is uh, the amount of mess in all that story. In Russia, in uh, the depth of it. The war there started basically two days ago when they called for mobilization. Before that, they just saw some events on the TV. We have a lot of clips with very drunk, demotivated, rowdy people who were not looking to be part of that mobilization. We have information about many towns, Narofaminsk, uh, Pskov, in the towns where Russian divisions were based from. Population is very depressed and shocked. Why? Because those towns are usually rather small, and everybody knows what's going on in that military detachment. In many of these detachments, they already had two rotations because of losses. And they understand the perspective of those who are being called to replenish the missing ones. 
So the first group that was destroyed were the Qadri military. The second was a mix of remnants of the first and more volunteers. Third is called upon to replace the second. And the population there is rather panicking. And that's, I'm talking, it's just those little military towns. And also there is Caucasus, where they have their own specifics. Dagestan and other republics that are being mobilized, they do not go to Russian Guard for special treatment, special positions a bit further out from the front, better food. No, they replenish 18th and 19th brigades of motorized infantries that are based out of that region. And they have had big losses as well. And given the fact that they're in Caucasus, they usually bury their lost, their dead uh, with the whole village or Aul, whatever is there, they are rather aware of their losses. So when they see all that, uh, and also with the genetic lack of love and actual hate towards Moscow, driven by many year history, I'm starting to think where will that all lead to? And what will be the blowback? Because it's what, second day, third day now? It is very difficult to call that a managed process, especially in the psychological reaction of population to these events. If Peskov, Putin's speaker, had to mention today that he is surprised by emotional and hysterical reaction of population to this mobilization, can you imagine what is going on if he had to officially say that on the third day of mobilization? I think they opened the Pandora's box. This is the main idiocy they could have done. Before that, they were fighting with Ukraine and Collective West. Now they will also have to fight, in addition to that, with their own populace, that they're trying to forcibly push into the fight against the first two. And on the third day, it looks like a very poorly managed process. These fights among the mobilized, taken on a lot of videos, crying children, crying women, and these people were not even given weapons yet. I don't know, you probably know the situation in Russia better than I do, and you can share a bit of your observation. But what I see on both formal and informal levels, it looks like a growing fire, brush fire. We'll actually add a bit to that brush fire right now. I got two clips from the Far East of Russia. They're both audio phone calls. Um, they probably were posted there in some forums and social media. They look like they're authentic. And let's listen to them. It's not video, it's just a conversation, just an audio. It's a conversation of mobilized people with their, at the first case, is, I think one case is wife, another, we don't know whom he's talking to. But uh, we can gauge what's going on by that content of that conversation. It appears that wrong people were called upon to mobilize. Let's see if Konstantin can plug it through. Yeah, they're fucking grabbed everybody they could and they don't know what fucking to do now. And Draft's point is saying that that's the same way they're collecting for the army, usually. Oh, Natalia, yeah, they're starting to return people back home because our draft officers are freaking idiots because they just wanted to fill the planned number. And apparently they were supposed to only call upon the ones who had real military experience, who had served in any war with real specialty, like driver, mechanic, sniper, and they're grabbing literally everybody. And now, actually, this morning already, many friends that I talked to here, they're saying, yeah, we're sitting, because our son, brother, husband were taken. They brought them to Vladivostok to collect her and check the documents and said, what the heck are you doing here? Go back. Go back home. You're not supposed to be drafted. 
Okay, you see the logic, right? And this is likely the proof that it's they're not pedaling back, but uh, the proof that it's a complete mess. After they brought people in, they probably realized that they brought uh, chronical drunks, retirees. Oh yeah, Buratia, that was a story. They drafted a man of the family with five kids who had never served. That made news. I think in these couple days we see the logic. They started grabbing everybody. Basically, yeah, the god up above will figure out who's who. Let's just... No, no, I think they just have a plan. They were given a plan on the region, you need to bring a thousand. Where will he take them, or does he have time to figure out who has specialty or not? Just grab everybody, they'll figure it out. You have no responsibility after that, because you did supply a thousand. See, another interesting note, the prep center for Vitya's uh, special forces of Russian army, they posted a special announcement calling for volunteers. So that's what they're calling about. You did not have to have served in military, that's an exclusion for the time, but that is unthought of, never happened like that before. You do not take physical activity to test. Amazing, right? You just need to carry your body and um, uh, armor. And that's for people who would be like those red berets and, you know, special forces. Third, you do not have to have any criminal prosecution closed. So you could be a criminal with active investigation, you can still come. That's interesting, right? Third uh, or fourth, what was it? Psychological test is simplified, no lie detector. So legendary special forces that were always elite, they had the set of traditions that is based on being elite and not letting anyone in. They dropped their selective level to the lower, lower of the lowest. And the last was freaking funny. Dude, come join us. You will here. You'll serve with professionals, not like with those other military regiments where nobody knows what they're doing. You'll have a higher chance to survive. So they're refutating their traditions. They're dropping their censorship level, and they're dropping their real selection. And that's what they're referring to the other military that you really have no chance to live there. So this is just the third day of mobilization. Even I cannot predict what's going to happen if they continue with it. This is like a big funnel, like that last straw that is about to break the camel's back. Well, this straw is pretty hefty, but you know, it's funny that they how they escalated. They failed to do what they initially planned to do, the complexity of it, and then they added more complexity by throwing that mobilization in, into the scheme. So, in your opinion, how do you think it may reflect on the front? Is it a way to persuade Ukrainian military to expedite their operation? Uh, maybe it's related to referendums, which they started already. By the way, that's funny. They started doing them in Russia. Their premise is that there are evacuees and removed people from Kherson, Donetsk and Lugansk, and they are based in Russia now, so they're doing these referendums as if in those places where they do hold them, uh, those people are voting for the regions. It's like in Russia, they figure, decide to vote for New York to secede from United States and join Chukotka. So do you think Ukrainian military will expedite their actions to occupy these territories, uh, basically kick the Russian occupants out to deoccupy them? Um, no, we're not going to change our plans. We have planned military activities and uh, we're just following the plans. What we see, though, is a lot of force, a lot of uh, forcible actions towards locals, how it happens. So in Kherson, we see a couple soldiers with an officer bring you documents and make you fill the papers. 
the only there is only one option. Uh, you have to write yes or no if you're for it or against it. If you write yes, okay. If you write against, you're being taken into filtration camp. So for us, this is another document for Hague Tribunal, Tribunal, and this is another war crime. And this is one of the terms of capitulation for Putin's regime, if it even survives to the point of signing that capitulation. But there is also another interesting note here. Our people, mostly using cyber methods, but also some others, we got the data of all those who got Russian passports on the occupied territories. And those people who are working for that uh, so-called referendums. So everything they had in the voting registration system, we got that data dump. Guys and gals, I can, those who are collaborating with the occupants, I cannot imagine a good destiny in your future. We know about we know about your existence. We know who you are. You will have an interesting biography in this life, albeit uh, somewhat short. But yeah, that's what I also wanted to say. We have over four hundred thousand watching us. Over a hundred thousand clicked the like button. Yes, Fagin Live indeed uh, just went over one point eight million uh, subscribers mark. So it depends upon you. How soon shall we cross the 2 million threshold? And that's uh, a request to you, whoever is watching us, those 40% who are not subscribing, please click subscribe button, that'll help us get there. Also, Alexei's channel is linked at the bottom, and the privateer station that is bringing that to you in English is also there, so subscribe, please. Um, what else? Uh, ripples from the Biden's statement at the UN General Assembly. In particular, von der Leyen, the head of European Commission, stated that it's time now to kick Russia out of the Security Council, permanent members of Security Council of the United Nations. And what was being talked about at the United Nations by Blinken, Biden and some others, it reminds of the launch of that story as well. We usually, you know, as you notice, start with some conversations and hypotheticals and at some point they end up being rather serious for Moscow. Just like we started about visas a while ago, right? Nobody believed when I was saying, hey, look, some of these Baltic countries are considering that. And then, boom, it's here. So the situation unfolds rapidly. It just uh, accumulates the enough potential to unfold first. So what do you think about that perspective? Yeah, I think it's just the beginning of the trouble. At first, we have a precedent when USSR was kicked out of League of Nations. So once it happened. The permanent member of Security Council was never kicked out, but, you know, things happen. There are a lot of countries who are looking forward to finding a way to do that. Whatever is being started by the Big Seven, the G7, your commission is now looking at the same premise, and their position is harder than Biden's position. There is also another option, they're trying to expand the number of permanent members of Security Council of United Nations. And if, for example, they take away the veto and will just do the general voting by simple majority, then they can make a decision, they can overrule Russian Federation every time. Although it's still an interesting precedent, how can you keep a country that is violating terms of military conflicts and human rights on a daily basis and terrorizing neighbors and killing civilians en masse? How can you keep that country in Security Council? So I hope, I don't know how it will happen, but uh, as I, th I think you're right. It'll start just like with visas minor notions and press here and there, and then all of a sudden floodgates open, and uh, it becomes a big waterfall that uh, might wash Russia out of Security Council of the United Nations. So if they do want to retain any authority, if that regime wants to still be there somehow in some capacity, right, and also the Security Council member,
uh, what security can we talk about in the current situation with the regime that started the biggest war after the Second World War and issuing direct threats of using nuclear weapons, breaking a couple dozen of different contracts and conventions and agreements. And we're still keeping that country in the United Nations. This is amazing. That cools down even some of the proponents of Putin's regime that you can find here and there in the world. And I think this discussion will have a proper conclusion when Russia will leave UN Security Council. We have another uh, notion, Iranian's ambassador. Uh, Accreditation in Kiev was taken away, he has to leave. Uh, their UAVs uh, done their deed. Remember we had some news about a month, month and a half, that Iranian UAVs are going to be used, that they already are in Russian possession. There was a scandal and I was informally sent a message from that ambassador that they're upset about our statements and uh, that there is no proof and all, you know, Iran now has uh, nobody to rely on besides themselves. They have chosen their side and the punishment uh, will start to come through. Do you think there'll be any other consequences to them? Americans, Israelis? It's difficult to forecast that part, but, um, you know, it's a sovereign right of the country to do certain things, but I want to say that the experience of their use on the front is very interesting to the Allies. Uh, okay. And we've been shooting them down with IGLA, the usual Soviet old uh, anti-air defense. This thing is a very slow flyer. It's got 200 kilometers an hour speed in the sky. It's nothing. It's almost standing. And it's very, very loud. So whenever it is an your reach, it's not difficult to shoot it down, even with older type of weapon. All right, interesting. So now there is another piece of news that French actor Alain Delon, he's uh, over 80, I think. Uh, he promised to visit Zelensky when he'll be able to walk again. Uh, I have not heard that news, but uh, of course he's a big figure. And I want to say that thanks to Andrei Yermak, we had that uh, meeting, actually several meetings in the United States when the First Lady Yelena Zelenska went there on the uh, UN campground. But they're very well-known uh, Hollywood frontliners. Are they going to visit Kiev as well? No, but they're going to be helping us uh, on the American side and promoting certain things and helping to gather resources. So that's another thing. Yermak is a movie producer, uh, besides other things. So he's got contacts and such stars as Angelina Jolie, that's his doing. Um, oh, you have not hugged and kissed her for me? No, I sorry, I was not in the office the day she was visiting. So we end up using that lever pretty successfully. So that's that's another interesting side of that story. And that's, that is supported by facts, right? It's not a fake, yeah, it's definitely uh, real news. Um, he is uh, not in best of his physical condition. I've seen him on the Belmondo's funeral. And uh, yeah, it's it reminds of uh, you know, in, in the press, there was a lot of fake articles that after that event, after Belmondo's death, that Delon Delon died in Switzerland or somewhere. But no, he is alive and kicking, and he'll come here when he can. Um, in Soviet Union, they deprecate the role of the actor. They treat actors as uh, service people, as people servicing the needs of the masses. Uh, while in reality, in the West, uh, the actor or actress is a very powerful figure, especially the first line, the, the list A actor. They have connections, they have money, they know how to achieve uh, different results, different groups uh, get involved in uh, social issues, and 
Yeah, when they participate in uh, something going on, that matters. So when uh, Ifa Lindelon gets here and uh, talks to our president and uh, they record an interview or something together, this is a man representing several epochs. He's uh, been a favorite actor of many people, especially in Europe. So it's kind of a forgotten genre when, you know, people with their actions support their values and beliefs. They kind of forgot about that in Russia. But I remember, you know, for example, when we were three minutes away from uh, the second wave of Russian descent here in uh, Bankovska Street when it was just announced on the second on the first day of war, I remember uh, Sean Connery uh, standing right next to me. Oh, sorry, uh, Sean Penn, uh, wrong last name. Uh, Sean Penn. Yeah, that's another good figure. Yeah, he stayed there and he said, uh, "Give me the rifle, I'll fight with you." Yep, so that was very war heartwarming. Um, and yeah, I'm a fan of uh, Friends TV series, and he was part of that, so that's, that's special for me. But that lever was often neglected on the Russian side. I actually had 17 years of my life spent in one or another capacity related to theater, and I know what the actor mastership is. These people are serious who went through that thorough transformation that you need to go through in order to play other people. This is a serious thing. For four years, and when they learn actors' actorship, you start 8 in the morning till 10 in the evening, and you work on everything. The manner of speech, the way you see the world or feel about the world, the way you walk, the way you express yourself. So these people who have enough guts to work on that and be so concentrated on that effort, they are by default strong uh, personalities. So very few people work that side of nature. Maybe doctors, maybe psychologists, maybe military. When you yes, actually consciously change the way you think, the way you move, the way you do a lot of things, and um, given that uh, in, on the West it's a big industry, there's a lot of money behind that too. So, being uh, having actors' experience as well, I was surprised by the level how effect uh, of how effective that uh, strategy came out to be. And I, I can confirm that because Kremlin was always neglecting um, Zelensky. You know, oh, he's a comedian. I, back in the day, was uh, defending Pussy Riot, and I actually used the same construct of uh, dropping political stuff into public media and connecting cultural and bohemian elite of the West. I, during my work for Pussy Riot, uh, I actually involved uh, the lead of Chili Peppers, uh, Peter Gabriel in New York, and it worked. The scale of that influence did work and did provide certain other pre cultural pressure on that case. And it works in a different capacity now, but uh, it still does. You know, you meet an actor and you're given more Heimers. And this is probably the biggest mistake of Russian history by undervaluing the capabilities of uh, one actor, Zelensky. So, our friend Roman Zembaluk, the citizen of Ukraine, Minister of Justice of Russian Federation, added to the list, just as myself, uh, of foreign agents. And that's along with uh, Dmitry Gordon, journalist, Ukrainian journalist. So, these factors are complete idiots there. I understand when they include Russian citizens in that list. How can you include foreign citizens in that list? Especially citizens of the country you're waging a war against. I don't know how you can treat their brain damage. I think they're just not all there. I don't know if uh, shock therapy or some extreme colonoscopy can help them to figure it out, because it's ridiculous. They maybe mark some historical wisdom in the fact that Russia will be the end of Russia. Because what they're doing now, it feels like a genie that's leaving the bottle. And it's a whirlwind of 
all things coming together. And uh, before Ukraine military or somebody else will get to Putin, I think it may be actually Russian people who will put an end to that. It's interesting. I also wanted to say one more thing, that sooner or later somebody in Russia will realize that a good way to avoid mobilization is to stop being a citizen of Russia together with the territory where you live. And how to do that? Well, for example, you say that your Krasnodar region secedes from Russian Federation. How can you be mobilized? You are an independent country. Well, Ukraine will recognize you and there probably will be other countries who will quickly recognize your presence. And then all of a sudden you cannot be mobilized because you are uh, living in a different country, a different state. Interesting story, right? Uh, let's talk about exchange once again. We'll show a picture of how from Russian uh, prison uh, they let Mikhail Dianov, uh, one of the Azov-style uh, fighters. He doesn't look well here. He is uh, definitely malnourished. Uh, he has uh, consequences of a serious wound with his uh, right arm. And we wanted to step in and help him a little. If anybody can help us connect with Mikhail Dianov or his relatives, maybe his wife or somebody, please uh, let us know how to get a hold of them. We'll find a way to transfer some support. Money is uh, never not needed, right? Yeah, for sure. Before uh, the official government system kicks in, uh, all these quick transfers, they absolutely help. Um, we had the project, I uh, remember that NFT project on the open sea when we were publishing different uh, digital works of artists that uh, transferred a little bit to our merchandising project that you are familiar with, that's in the stores currently, that are printing products with Fagin Aristovich logos. You can even buy them uh, from Russia. Just one note, do not wear them uh, out in the street. Oh no, Mark, they should be wearing it when they'll go storming Kremlin. Well, that's another option. Yes, that's a good reason to wear it. Uh, although in Russia it's a little tricky to make a purchase because their credit cards are not really accepted. Uh, so one needs to be find creative ways to pay for it. This is what we have there right now. We have a stream tomorrow, right? Yes, we do. Okay, so let's discuss the continuation of protests. I was asked to make an announcement by several people. Um, movement uh, Spring is starting a special action on the 24th of September that will be happening throughout Russia. You see, so probably saw announcements of that in the Russian webs. Um, in Dagestan, they'll have another action. I had a special message from that group. They will have uh, a special action titled Military Draftsman and Police are Sons of Bitches. Um, they're starting at 3 the same day, so Dagestan also has uh, that, and you can find that data on their interwebs. Mark, I have a feeling that somebody wants to get rid of him, right? Because Dagestan and Buryatia lost a lot of people, and it appears that Dagestan's people are almost especially being wasted here, because they're being thrown in the most difficult parts of it. And I'm under the impression that somebody in the Caucasus is trying to get rid of uh, their competitors or whoever they see as competitors, because uh, at the rate that Dagestan uh, mobilized, people are getting not dying here at war, that's impressive. Um, I, by the way, I got a message with the uh, coordinates of uh, sister of uh, Mikhail. Okay, good. We'll uh, send money tomorrow. Probably a bit too late today. And I continue to say that uh, we have to per be persistent. We started uh, initially with very low stats on this channel, right? We continued and persevered, and now 
that's where we are. So our call upon you in Russia, those who are touched by this mobilization, your close ones, your relatives, parents, wives, anybody who have people who are part of that mobilization, you have to gather somewhere. And the easiest way is uh, to do that right in front of your administration. Usually there is a big square right in front of that administration. Just gather there. And this is a very good reason to do it. You need to come and ask questions. Why are you being mobilized? You do not want to partake in that event and communicate with each other. Just be there. Make that presence. Because there will be a peak at some point when the first coffins will start traveling back home with those mobilized people. There'll be a lot more people. You know, there were skeptics telling us that nobody will come, nobody will protest. Well, no, in many parts they starting. They're throwing fires, uh, fire bombs at uh, drafting places. In Caucasus they have a serious series of protest. And I wonder, by the way, in Chechnya they even specifically excluded from mobilization. So I wonder how are the neighborly regions thinking about that. But that's uh, the perspective. If we do not like that you are drafting our people, uh, you'll have trouble. So why not, you know, why Dagestan is worse than Chechnya? Dagestan's 19th division is being destroyed there since 2014. And uh, they have a lot of deceased, a lot of people who died at that war. I have a lot of videos from Dagestan coming out, appealing to their military command, what they need to do and where they need to go. So slowly that fire starts to burn and that system starts to increase with every video, with every person joining that. The soul starts to add to the big fire. And on the information front, that keeps growing. What's his name? Uh, how we said here, remember? Changes accumulate gradually, but realize rapidly. By the way, that 18th division that was completely decimated in the 2014s, and then even had to reform to 42nd. Just think about that on the Caucasus. Kremlin has a strategy of destroying certain republics, of decimating your populace. Same as you, same as Buryatia, same as some other parts of the country. I'm not even talking about other regions, but just putting the flashlight on these. So step by step, keep gathering, keep sending videos, Keep filling the information field with your presence. If Piskov, on the third day of this mobilization, had to come out and state that he's surprised by the emotional level of protest, trust me, they got some data that is really worrisome, so that the press secretary of president had to come out and say that he is surprised, there is fear behind his surprise and you are the ones who caused his fear. And the more you'll be open, the more he will be afraid and surprised. And eventually the whole thing will crash, burning. And you do have what to fight for. You have your liberties, your rights and lives of your children to fight for. Right, so we continue with our tactics. 7 p.m. There may be not many people, could be one or two. That's all right, that's normal. That's how we started. And we'll be reminding you regularly that every day you can come to the square in front of your administration, gather relatives, come yourself, take those who are mobilized or being requested to go. It's important for us that not just students come out. It's important for us, for the core people, those people who have seen life, who may be a little drunk, who would come to the administration and start asking questions, what the heck do they need to go to the front for? What, uh, whose interests they're defending there and why do they need to die for that? And students, yeah, they will rebel, they'll be about something else. They have an ongoing political protest. 
For us, it's important to bring out to talk those who actually will be dying if that comes through uh, with the mobilization and everything. So eventually we'll start gathering data about who's gathering where and, you know, at some point there'll be big crowds of thousands. I'll show tomorrow a map of uh, so-called national battalions, how it is designed, what they were supposed to uh, draft from the regions, and you'll see your perspectives. It's an interesting document, 470,000 watching us live, a lot of people click the like button, we've been live for about 45 minutes. I'll see you tomorrow all at 10. Come to see our stream, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich and to the Privateer Station if you are watching listening to that in English. Goodbye.